Agenda item 7, County Manager's Report, Ms. Dukes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Commissioners. <clears throat> uh, one by Austin Lowndes will be coming to our next work session to present a concept called a College and Career Academy. This is a tool that some communities have used to engage young people um, of high school age and put them on a track that provides technical training for specific career paths that works either in conjunction with a technical college or similar to a technical college to um, put our young people out of high school into the workforce at a living wage much sooner than they would have before. Um, I attended a luncheon not long ago about this concept and while I was there with many educators and uh, local uh, business owners and in our industry that were looking at it from the standpoint of, of developing workforce and or furthering or helping these children complete their education, I saw how it plugs into some of our juvenile justice numbers and the benefit of giving our young people a, a different opportunity. And, and age-wise, it, it captures their attention right in line with what we know begin to be the years that they start to get in substantial trouble. So as accompaniment to that, you will find a handout um, that is an update on our uh, quarter three report, the lounge grantee snapshot for our juvenile justice grants. Look on the second page of that, you will see that 33% of the children in this program are 14 years old. And so this, this College and Career Academy concept would get them as they're coming into high school, and, and that seems to be when we're right now seeing at least a third of our young people that are that are engaging with the courts, that that's the age that they're plugging in there. So um, I would like for you all to understand more about the concept. I think that, that while we're not a school system, as a local government and certainly a stakeholder in the future of our children, that this is something that if we're not formally participating in, it's something that we can certainly look at supporting if you all found it valuable as well. So we'll have Mary Beth Brownlee from ABL here to present at the next work session. <clears throat> also, you have a handout that is a schematic that Dr. Eanes, our public health director, um, has put together for a new building. You all know that some of his offices are currently in the old 325 West Savannah Avenue a location, and some of his offices are in the HR building as well as in various areas around town, and Dr. Eanes would like to bring all of these things together on one campus to be a better one-stop shop for our citizens. Um, we also have DFACS that's in the HR building, and one of the things that the chairman and I learned today on a tour is that sometimes that security that DFACS requires being at the door at the HR building can be an impediment for people coming in for care. They just don't like having to go through security. So um, Dr. Eanes has worked with a local architect, architect for just what you see before you know additional engineering work has been done there. They're talking to a property owner about a possible location um, on 41, South 41, and whenever we asked today what we could do to help this project move forward, he said just begin to increase awareness. So I wanted to give you all a copy of that layout. The county's only responsibility um, is the clinic. Um, those other buildings that you see on that layout would be uh, partnerships that Dr. Eats would, would form with investors to build those additional buildings. Um, certainly the chairman uh, serves on that board and can tell you more about the particulars there. Um, but again, I see this as a great opportunity to help take care of some of the things that we know are some gaps in services for some folks that really need those services. And I, I agree with all that information. Um, it, the concept of having all of your public health uh, centers basically on one campus and creating this campus concept uh, ideally, um, it, it's much better than what we currently have. They're spending currently a substantial amount of money each month on renting these facilities, and so those resources could be turned back around and utilized uh, through a public-private partnership on these other facilities for that rent kind of to continue. But if we put all of their resources at one location. Uh, it, it does separate some of those services because some of those services uh, really kind of require separation. Um, and, and so there's uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and I think it's a very good concept. And so they are moving forward with that. And as we go along, and I think that as Paige was saying, the best thing that we can do at this point in time 
would be from an educational standpoint of talking about it and supporting it within the community uh, because they'll, they're going to begin to hear about it and they're going to be asking you questions, what's going on with our public health department, uh, and, and this is going to be kind of what we're looking at. Is this the proposed site? That is the proposed site as it stands right now. They're talking with the property owner. Uh, the property was for sale, uh, and I think they're getting some very positive, uh, positive reaction from the property owner. Of course, they would like to see that property there as well. And our responsibility is the clinics. The health. Adult you know, sir, just that main the main structure that you see there. So the children's clinic is something that uh, Dr. Gross started that uh, Dr. Eats has leaned into. We are we don't have a lot of specialists for pediatrics here in our community. So the health department has set up a telemedicine environment so that children who have maybe adrenal problems or seizure disorders or things like that that there's not a specific specialist here for. They can go in and meet with the nurses and be overseen from a teledoc situation from a doctor that might be in Atlanta or Gainesville or, or somewhere like that. So they want to expand those, those services. Then the adult health clinic, you'll see in parentheses there, um, this function that that clinic provides. That's the clinic that was in our Leela Ellis building that is currently um, moved to another location. So the larger building that you see there that would have the Lowndes County Health Department on one side and then Vital Records and WIC would all be under one roof, um, that facility would be the facility that we would be responsible for there. Um, also, the uh, records um, storage, or the storage that you see over off to the side, they, just like us, um, you know, work to manage their budget as well as their record storage requirements. And this would provide an on-site facility that would alleviate what they're paying now in rental space for record storage. They're currently, I got the number right, they're currently spending roughly $20,000 a year just for rental space for record storage. So again, that's a resource that can be utilized through a public-private partnership. Again, put everything on the one campus. And they're paying $22,000 a month in rent, and that can go a long way to retire on the facility that would be. And they can get their money a lot easier, uh, it appears, um, through leases and rental than they can through purchasing type situations. So that's kind of the direction we're going in. I don't want to put too much information out there right now because a lot of it is just, I mean, it's very new information and they're moving forward with this, but we had a discussion with them probably two weeks ago on this. Um, and so it's, um, it's moving along pretty quickly now. And I'm sure that the, you know, the big step is going to be the acquisition of the property. So right now, those those com those discussions are moving in a positive direction. Do you have any particular parts of it that you'd like more information? If you'd like to talk to Dr. Eads, if you'd like to tour the current HR building to kind of get a feel for what their needs are, please let me know. We'll be glad to set all that up for you. Um, moving on, at 10 a.m. on Thursday, we have the groundbreaking for the new control tower at Veloster Regional Airport. And then i just like to remind everyone, if you'd like to participate in our hygiene and canned good donation drive, those are due by the end of the day on Friday so that we can get them delivered the first of the week. And the last thing on my report this evening is um, we heard from Kelly Godsey with the National Weather Service last week on our forecast for hurricane season and our current weather environment. And i just look, like for Ashley to share some of that information with you, actually, if you'll talk about the La Nina and then also just the atmospheric environment that we're in with some of these pop-ups that like we had early this morning or late last night. So unfortunately, the, the, um, the news was not what we considered favorable. Um, I think that everyone is a little on edge given that we had our unit value last year and then we've had so many significant thunderstorms lately. Uh, anytime we have something, people get nervous. Uh, what we did learn is the, uh, and it was not unexpected, but the forecast for the upcoming hurricane season is for a um, very active season. Uh, I think they were 80% confident that we would have an above normal season. Uh, the, uh, the experts out at Colorado State University who typically do a pretty good job predicting. They actually give a specific number, and I think their number was 23 um, hurricanes this year is what they're predicting. NOAA always 
gives a range. I think it was 17 to 23. Um, but what the factors that influence that and, and how they come up with those numbers, um, you always hear El Nino, La Nina. So basically, without getting into too much detail, El Nino is good, La Nina is bad. Now, I say El Nino is good, last year was El Nino year. And that typically is supposed to mean that there's less activity in the Atlantic because the, the conditions are um, less favorable. So the hurricanes were, were able to overpower El Nino last year. Now we've moved into uh, La Nina this year. Um, what La Nina means are the water temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic are already warmer than normal. So they're not having to wait for things to warm up like they normally do. So that's going to provide the energy to those storms. Um, we also, La Nina provides um, a very low wind shear. Wind shear is what, it tears hurricanes apart, so they don't like wind shear. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of wind shear. Um, so all of the conditions are setting up for, a lot of, for us to have a lot of storms this year. Um, but the one thing that we've said just about every year we've had on these workshops is they do a good job of predicting the number of storms, they still can't predict now where they're going to go. So last year, um, you'd probably be surprised to know that of the 23 storms we had, one, only one of them made landfall in the U.S. Unfortunately, it, 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 unfortunately, it came right across Lowndes County. So for everybody else, it was a quiet year, but for us, it was very busy. Um, and so our hope is that the opposite is going to happen this year, that it will be um, you know, it will be quiet and, and there will be a lot of storms and they'll all stay out to sea and nobody will get affected or it won't come here. But we don't, our, our main purpose of having those workshops and, and looking at forecasts is not to scare people and make them, people think, oh my goodness, we're going to have all these hurricanes because we don't know where they're going to go. We could get, we could get, um, you know, a hit again or we could, could be spared. But we use it to highlight the importance of being prepared. And so our, our focus has always been we're going to prepare like we're going to get hit every year. And if we don't have them, then it's a, you know, it, is, it was very little effort that went into preparing. But if we don't prepare and get hit, then the, the consequences are, are um, catastrophic. So um, we, are, we are gearing up for a very active season. Um, I've been working. The good, the good thing about hurricane season, I say we work with our partners and the other department heads, but we don't really have to do a lot to gear up because we just stay prepared all the time. Um, you know, but even outside of the hurricanes, kind of the pages point, um, we always have um, lots of, of thunderstorm activity here in the summer. Typically it's in the late afternoon because as things get hotter, it heats up, creates that instability. There's, fuels those thunderstorms, so, um, you know, I would encourage people, even if we don't get hit by a hurricane, we're always under threat of something, and I think, I think what we saw a couple of months ago when that straight line yen came through, it didn't destroy the whole county, but for those people in that area where those straight line winds came through, that was just as devastating as a hurricane, so we need to be prepared, whether it's a small storm, or a big one like a dog, um, and then be prepared for whatever. And so that's kind of been our focus and our message, but we are expecting to, to be pretty busy um, over the next few months. So if you have any questions about hurricane season, I'll do my best to answer them. Any questions? Thank you, Ashley.